so I can. Oh yes. So you now have to control. Hmm. And I think we you, you should pause recording right now. Yeah. How uh, do I? So let me see where do I go to pause. Oh, there you go. From the pit. Okay. Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for joining us in the Venus um, Day, which essentially is a joint collaboration between the interventional radiologists and vascular surgeons of Norwich, uh, based in Norwich University Hospital and and Bahrain uh, and 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 Bahrain Defence Forces. This. We've got a fantastic faculty of people from the region, um, from from around the Gulf, who have got who are who are attending the session today to share their fantastic experiences from which we can all benefit. Um, um, this is a continuation of our original original workshop, which unfortunately had to be disrupted. Uh, we had to stop for the last day. We couldn't continue because because of um, uh, quite a sad uh, episode and event where a very close member of our team had passed away. And therefore this is to continue with that. Um, and uh, we've, we're, we're very fortunate that we brought all the faculty back together and um, for them to share their experiences with us. Um, the, the, the session will be basically short presentations from each of our faculty. Um, we will collate all the questions, which we will discuss at the very end with a roundtable discussion. Um, so without any further ado, I would like uh, a good friend and, and our close and our main collaborator from Bahrain, um, Dr. Martin Marish, to, to start with his introductory presentation. Yeah, thank, thank you, Martin. You. Thank you very much, Tarek. And it's a great pleasure to, to be here with you again. It's, uh, as Tarek said, this is basically the continuation of of our three-day uh, workshop uh, master classes, the last day was dedicated to the to the Venus uh, pathologies and and alignment. The the workshop uh, in general was very very successful. It was based on uh, hands-on simulations with uh, a lot of stations. The first day was the aortic one. The second we discussed the peripheral disorders, and uh, unfortunately the last one was cancelled because our brother and uh, friend and dear colleague uh, Isa Mosman uh, passed away. Uh, he was present uh, uh, at the event. This is a picture with Dr. Mohammed Ahmed and Khalid Abu Ghaffar, the, uh, our administrators, uh, awarded uh, our dear friend with the uh, uh, award for, for his contribution in educating uh, uh, junior vascular uh, surgeons. So, uh, just to get to the to the Venus session, uh, it's very close to me because it's like perfect uh, illustration of the evolution of our specialty when we moved uh, very rapidly uh, from from the knives to the wires and and the balloons, and uh, this is obviously the the opening the door for for much more complex uh, treatment because. For many, many decades, the the venous surgeries was basically just a varicose vein surgery and the, and the venous occlusions like DVT was left on the medical treatment. But this is the past and, and in future will be called uh, much more often. And it's the, the whole uh, pathophysiology behind this is that the obstruction always uh, causing, especially the proximal obstruction is always causing the venous hypertension, which is the main, uh, which is the main uh, disease we are, we are dealing with. Uh, I don't like uh, using varicose veins that often because this is the old school understanding of the venous pathology. So what we are dealing with is the obstruction and the venous hypertension or let's say chronic venous insufficiency. Uh, very important talking about the venous bed is to understand the differences between the arterial and the venous bed because that this was the source of the of the initial frustrations. The vascular surgeons were trying to just put whatever they learned from the arterial job to, and put it into the venous uh, bed, but it's unfortunately didn't work. 
because these are not the same. You know, the, the venous uh, pathologies are completely different. It's not, we are not dealing with the atherosclerosis. It's, it's also the, the blood flow and the, the physiology of the venous drainage outflow is very different from arterial back, where uh, the high velocities and high pressure is generated by the direct pumping action of the heart. This is gone in the in in uh, microcirculation and capillary system. So the, the 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 pressures and the velocities in the venous bed are completely different. It's very um, very important to understand these principles. So before anyone is thinking to jump into the venous uh, uh, treatment. Uh, there is a lot to learn uh, and and the basic understanding of the pathology uh, and, and the physiology in the venous bed is, is essential and it's very important. It's starting with the images as well in, and the imaging in for the venous pathologies is very different than for the arterial. What you what you remember, you know, the nice uh, uh, DSA images, the nice arteriograms, you won't see this in the venous bed because the blood flow goes with the low resistance, and uh, and very often what you can see on the on the screen is this kind of just a plexus of of the of uh, collaterals. You have no idea where the main venous drainage. Uh, are going. So we'll be discussing this uh, later today about the importance of combining ultrasound, CT, MRI, and the role of IVOS in, in understanding of the pathologies. So I will just uh, go ahead with my presentation. Uh, and my role today is to describe the, the basic principles of the recanalizations of chronic venous obstructions, which is usually caused by the chronic DVT. So I use a couple of uh, uh, cases and, and I will try to uh, elaborate on the possible complications and the basic principles. The first case is a, a lady in her 40s and you will see the majority of these patients are quite young, active patients. That's why you know the treatment of this patient is so, so, difficult, uh, so important. So she, she was suffering from sudden onset of left uh, leg swelling and pain, very typical ultrasound confirmed lacudilio femoral DVT. Then when we started the procedure on the IVOS, we found out that there is very significant chronic uh, part of, of the problem. So the, the, the May Turner perhaps caused the gradual thrombosis of the left iliac and then some moment she just got like massive onset of acute uh, trom uh, thrombosis. That's why we started with a thrombolysis and initially we lysed the, the acute part of the blood clot and then this was uh, combined with the uh, catheter direct directed thrombectomy and, and uh, at the end we finished the case with the angioplasty and stenting. Uh, the patient immediately improved and, and she was discharged walking. You can see the massive edema on the left side. Uh, the prone position, usually we starting, we are starting with the popliteal excess. You can see the this is the this is the eye was run, uh, where you can see, you can appreciate at this level the significant mater nerve compression, uh, obliterating the the blood flow, you can see the waste of the balloon here and the stenting and the unobstructed flow at the end of the procedure. And here you can see again the the the, the eye was run after the after the stenting, the open vein, unobstructed, unobstructed flow. The it's very important to use the stents with a high radial force because at the May Turner uh, point, you could still see some kind of uh, compression of the stent. This is very important image at the end of the procedure is crucial to check the inflow. So the, the ultrasound is uh, present in the, in the theater all the time and after the procedure, it's very important to check the inflow uh, at, at the femoral level. And I just want to highlight that the deep femoral vein is perhaps much more important than the femoral vein itself. The second case is a young gentleman in his uh, 30s and uh, he, he sustained uh, trauma uh, three years ago prior coming to us. And uh, uh, obviously the, the DVT linked to this trauma. And uh, within these three years, uh, he gradually developed very significant post-thrombotic uh, syndrome with suffering with edema and uh, venous claudications. He developed a venous ulcer. 
So ultrasound and we did the MRV in his case, confirmed ocular didili of femoral vein. And there was extent of the thrombus all the way to the IVC, all the way to the level of the renals. So decision was not easy, but he, since uh, because of the severity of, of his uh, uh, complaints, his life was debilitated, he lost the job. So we decided to go for the recanalization, which was very difficult and it took like four hours. We ended up uh, being able to get the, uh, the wires all the way through the chronic uh, clot and we ended up uh, stenting him up. This case is uh, very interesting because it was complicated with on-table partial thrombosis of the IVC uh, stent, uh, despite full heparin. Uh, we used to use, in these cases, heavy heparinization, starting usually with 10,000 international units uh, uh, initially, and then we are uh, checking the ACT timing. Uh, despite this, uh, he, he uh, developed uh, partial thrombosis. Uh, this was treated successfully with uh, directed angiogenic thrombectomy, and uh, at the end of the procedure, we found a good femoral flow, and it was documented. So you can see the massive edema on this side, atypically on the right side because it was linked to the fracture. You can see the heavy collaterals at the beginning initially. <clears throat> IVC was completely occluded. This is the run of the IVUS, which is not interesting because it's basically all occluded. So these are the wastes uh, on the on the balloons, and here at this point, I believe at the, at the proximal side you can see the partial thrombus. Uh, this was seen also. This was confirmed on the on the IVUS, and that's why IVUS is crucial and so important in in dealing with the uh, complication in these cases. It's uh, very difficult to deal with uh, with this page, uh, these cases without the IVOS. You can see here the the angiojet, which is a uh, uh, very beneficial of angiojet is that you can direct the suction uh, uh, direction. So for this kind of uh, complication, the angiojet is very uh, very uh, effective. You can see unobstructed flow afterwards. Uh, no collaterals, and this is the Valsalva maneuver of the femoral inflow at the end of the procedure. The patient was very happy immediately afterwards. The third case is a, a lady in her 50s, neglected DVT, treated by the uh, medical management. So we waited for four more months because it's it's beneficial to wait for the for the inflammatory phase to go away and intervene later on. Uh, the iliofemoral thrombosis was confirmed by the ultrasounds and the CT as well. And <laughs> in the meantime, patient developed severe post-thrombotic syndrome as well. She was unable to walk. She came to our clinic uh, on a wheelchair. Uh, the recanalization itself was, uh, again, very difficult. And I you know, want to highlight this. When you start doing these procedures, just be sure that it takes some time, dedicate this time for the patients, and you really, you know, uh, have to be patient. Uh, we did the angioplasty and the stenting and patient improved immediately. That's the gratifying part of the procedures, This because it's a basic hemodynamic. So after successful recanalization, all these patients improved, some of them on table and almost all of them is in first 24 hours so you can see the massive post thrombotic syndrome the uh, occluded vein based of the balloons and the and the recanalization successfully and she came the next week uh, walking uh, is reduced that i'm a very happy patient the last case uh, is uh, again young fellow who was cycling on his bicycle and fell and uh, he injured his femur, and because of the immobility, he developed massive DVT. <clears throat> CT venography and, and, and ascending venography confirmed massive iliofemoral occlusion. And uh, unfortunately, we didn't even find the, the inflow veins. The deep femoral vein was encased with a, in, within a thrombus, so we didn't have any inflow. We decided to go for hybrid procedure in this case. And we started with the end of phlebectomy in the groin, uh, followed by the difficult recanalization. But at the end, we we finally were able to uh, recanalize the segment and stented and stented him up. This is the gentleman, as you can see. This venous answer was just coming and going. It, he was unable to find the job. He was unable to get married. 
very debilitating lifestyle because of this uh, uh, medically treated DVT in his young age. This you could see this was the initial venogram from the from the popliteal vein, and this was the occlusion of the deep femoral vein. There, so there was no inflow. Without deep femoral vein, it's very difficult to keep the reconstruction patent. So this is how the endophlebectomy was looking like the venous pitch and in insertion of the of the uh, sheet through the pitch. And this is the flow afterwards in the femoral vein. And here, this is this is just for the illustration how fast it worked. So he's still having the dressing, but the venous ulcer is already uh, already almost healed. So this is like 10 days after the surgery. So it works fantastically when, uh, when it happened to be successful. So just uh, as a conclusion, chronic venous obstructions can cause a severe morbidity and very high recurrence. The goal is to provide unobstructed the drainage from the legs to the IVC. It uh, brings the specific complications, early instant thrombosis, lymphatic leak, seroma, bleeding or infection. But <clears throat> the venous stenting is uh, always necessary in chronic occlusion. It's impossible to get out just with a balloon. These lesions are very, very elastic. The, the density of the chronic thrombus is like the eraser rubber. It's very tough and it's elastic. So the, the stent is mandatory. There is no ideal venous stent and it's very difficult to fabricate the ideal uh, venous stent because you need a very wide lumen, the very long lenses and very high radial force. And this is very difficult to get it uh, all three in, in characteristics in, in one stent, you know. Anyhow, the venous stenting is recommended by the all major societies and surgery, we keep it in, in a pocket only in case of the failure. I just want to highlight the importance of intravascular ultrasound. Again, it's a mandatory tool for the diagnostic to understand the anatomy because it's very difficult to see the branches on, on the venography. Uh, it's mandatory for the measurement and sizing because sizing in these cases is extremely important. If you downsize the stand, it's very high risk of migration. Oversizing is also not uh, uh, <clears throat> advise, advisable because then it's causing a, a, a complication and, and late thrombosis as well. And it's also mandatory to, uh, to manage the complication as we illustrated before. Uh, so the venous stenting is a treatment of choice, especially for the young patient. It's, it reduces uh, post-thrombotic morbidity and it improves uh, quality of life. Well, thank you for the attention. We'll keep the questions till the end of the block. Here is my email and feel free to email any questions even after the after the workshop and I'm very happy to answer them all. And I'll give the, the word to Dr. Tarek again. Thank you very much, Martin, for that fantastic presentation. <laughs> um, uh, I think, as, as as Martin said, we'll keep the questions towards the end and we need to move on so we stick to time. Um, so I would not, I, would, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Ahmed Gawish uh, from Egypt uh, to have a to 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 to, to um, present um, his case and his experiences with Venus. Thank you very much, Ahmed, please. Thank you. Thank you, Tari. Can you hear me well? Can you see my slides? OK. Absolutely. Okay. So first of all, I'd like to, to thank uh, Martin and uh, Dr. Doffer for uh, organizing uh, that uh, workshop, which uh, we had uh, an unforeseen event, as you said, but uh, we're all happy to see each other again. Um, so uh, after Martin, I will, uh, I will present to you an interesting case, not that interesting when we, while we were doing it, but actually uh, the result was interesting. So actually, when we're talking about deep vein thrombosis, when we're talking about acute iliofemoral DVT, the guidelines actually are clear that the mainstay of treatment for DVT overall is by anticoagulation. And it is in that subgroup of patients with iliofemoral DVT, yeah. if they have their young age, with uh, good life expectancy, low risk of bleeding, and the symptoms are less than 21 days with the first episode of DVT, maybe catheter direct thrombolysis or other interventional therapy might help with or without under the cover of an IVT filter or not. So despite anticoagulation being the, the most commonly and widely used and most advocated method of treatment, some subgroup of patients might benefit from intervention. 
And actually, further to the indication, some people rely on giving anticoagulation and seeing the response in 48 hours. If patients respond well with, for anticoagulation in the 48 hours with relief of symptoms, they will continue anticoagulation. However, if, patient, if they have persistent symptoms or some phlegmasia signs, then intervention would be clearly indicated. Having said that, there are multiple intervention tools available now in the market. Some of them rely on the CDT or the catheter direct thrombolysis alone. Some combine mechanical thrombectomy with uh, infusion of the drug. And some rely only on suction thrombectomy or percutaneous mechanical thrombectomy. And we are all, most of us are aware of the available tools in the market. However, when we're talking about subacute DVT, which are as not as chronic as Martin's third case that, that actually he postponed the intervention to three months or four months later to intervene as a chronic. And it's not so acute when it's within the two or three weeks window in the early phase, then the confusion starts. Should we intervene or should we postpone and delay the intervention for later on? And that's the, the meat of our case. Our case is a 35 years old, young male patient. He lived in uh, the UAE. Uh, he presented to us back in, uh, so, sorry, it, it was not presented to us. He presented in March 2022 back in the UAE with a sudden onset of bilateral low limb edema, ascites, and scrotal edema. Investigations were done in uh, Virgil Hospital in the Emirates and showed an advanced testicular tumor, non seminomatite together with a pa paraortic lymph nodes compressing the lower IVC. That was the initial CT done while he was in the Emirates. He immediately returned to Egypt and an orchiectomy was done with four cycles chemotherapy and he had marvelous improvement. The ascites subsided and the, the edema resolved. However, a CT follow-up so showed fantastic diminished signs of the, the paraortic lymph nodes that uh, previously appeared in the previous CT. But you can see that in the CT done uh, at that time in June, a floating lower IVC thrombus was protruding from the right iliac, and uh, uh, you can see it clearly here in the video. Uh, this actually didn't appear in the previous CT done uh, pre-chemo. So an estimated thrombus age was unknown. It was estimated to be more than definitely more than three weeks, but less than three months in that window. So we have a case with a floating IVC thrombus which looked subacute to chronic, cancer associated in a young adult, previously symptomatic. Now, at, at the time of presentation to us, he was totally asymptomatic. But he was planned for laparotomy and lymph node biopsy because that was mandatory to, uh, to continue his treatment to take a lymph node biopsy. So at this situation, uh, the first question that would come to our mind, is intervention indicated in such patients? And the second question, if we decided that we would go for thrombus removal strategy, would we put a filter or not? And the third question would be, which modality would be suitable for such a case? Would we go for catheter directed thrombolysis versus pharmacomechanical or pure mechanical? So those were the main three questions that we tried to answer. Of course, in, a, in an interactive setup, we would ask and discuss, but now I will make it easier and give you the answer straight away. Our decision was to intervene, that intervention was indicated, given that we have a floating thrombus in the IVC with risk of embolization, especially if the patient was planned for laparotomy, as the patient was mandatory to take a lymph node biopsy. So the second question, whether an IVC filter were to be put or not, we, we, we decided that that would not be an easy procedure and would not be an easy manipulation for the thrombus. So it's better to put a filter, and that's what we exactly did two days pre-intervention. We put the filter in because of uneasy expected manipulations during procedure. And the third thing, the third question was about which modality we preferred. We prefer to go for mechanical thrombectomy, given that the catheter direct thrombolysis and, uh, with the lytic, that chronicity might cause failure. And we were planning to directly attack the big bulk of the thrombus rather than fragmenting it with a lytic. So that was our choice, and this is how things go. So, so that's the initial venogram. You can see clearly the shadow of the, uh, the IVC thrombus. 
Um, can you see it clearly in the in the video? Yeah. Okay. Good. So after having this, we 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 went in with the Cat Eight uh, Penumbra catheter with different manipulation to to try to to suck things out and everything. If you worked with the Penumbra, you get the noise of having engaged with something and you get you, then you get out. It wasn't that easy and straightforward so each each uh, every couple of maneuvers we 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 had to to get the penumbra out and flush it with saline because it actually it was occluded because that thrombus was truly old age not uh not fresh so after many manipulations we were happy to find that the eye now we dislodged the 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 the, the, the thrombus from its place but as you can notice <clears throat> up there in the filter, you can find a big chunk uh, in the filter. And at that point, we we didn't we asked ourselves, should we continue to get this chunk of uh, uh, thrombus from the filter, or just leave it as it is? But fear it, with the fear that if we left this, it might include the whole uh, IVC. We we decided that we should go in with the penumbra catheter again. To, to try to to get uh, this chunk out, and we we were able to engage it in the penumbra. But however, when we we were going down with drawing the penumbra, it again you can see it residing in the left common iliac vein, occluding it, and you can see the collateral that appeared because of the occlusion, the obstruction to the left common iliac vein. So now we had to go from the right side and try to engage again the thrombus and after manipulation again a small chunk remained in the filter again so we went up again and suck it out we were successful to get part of it but again a small part remained inside the filter and then we went again with with the catheter to to get it out so after many manipulations we were able to to clear everything from uh, the filter as well as from the IVC. So that's how we started, and that was the final phenogram, as you can see, with unobstructed flow uh, uh, in the IVC. So that was the situation. We successfully removed the whole chunk of the thrombus. The patient was planned to go for laparotomy after a week, and we were planning to retrieve the filter afterwards after they finish everything. So. So that's all. That's all about the case that we uh, we 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 made our decision, and I'm happy to to discuss it with you. Uh, which strategy should we follow in the patients with not acute, not in the first three weeks, but rather a more um, organized thrombus? Should we go in? Should we? Shouldn't we go in? That I'm open to discussion. And finally. Uh, I would like to thank you, and this is this meeting is in the memory of a great man, a really great man, and I um, actually chose this case in particular because that case uh, I presented before in the Alexandria Vascular uh, Conference, and uh, I was happy this uh, image, uh, this photo showed uh, Professor uh, Atam Osman discussing the case with me. He was not happy for intervening for such a case. But I was happy to to rebuttal back, and we had this discussion. So, um, um, yeah, that's just uh, uh, to remember a great uh, man. And thank you for listening. Thank you very much. That was a very interesting case. Um, so, uh, as as you said, you know, I'm sure there are a lot of people who are very keen on asking questions, and I've definitely made a list of questions myself, Ahmed. Um, so, so well, obviously we'll, uh, Kelvin and I will be collating these questions and we'll be presenting them at the end. Um, so our next speaker is going to be Colonel Dr. Zafar Kamal from Bahrain, who is a vascular surgeon. And um, um, Zafar, you're, you're going to be playing your uh, presentation, is that right? So we're ready when you are. If you'd like to share your screen. Uh, yes, sir. I think this is my screen.
Okay. Yeah, uh, your screen. Is it, is it shared? Yes. Thank you. Uh, Bafa, there is no sound. I think I know why. Um, I'll I'll play it from my my end if that's okay. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Kelvin. No problem. <clears throat> Hello everyone, my name is Dafar Kamal. I'm a vascular surgeon from Bahrain and I will be uh, talking to you today about uh, a case of uh, SVC uh, syndrome. Uh, this is a 27-year-old uh, Can we stop the first one? end-stage renal disease since childhood. Did you want me to stop? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they're overlapping, that's all. Oh, okay. So, Doctor, if you stop, stop, don't share it from your side, and you stop it from your side, then Kelvin will play your recording, and then we will, you know, make note of all the questions. I stop. I stop from my side. Okay. Excellent. I think we just start from here, from this, from the case. Okay. Uh, due to Alport syndrome, she had uh, as a child multiple central venous catheters for hemodialysis. She had a failed renal transplant in 2007. And in 2013, she had a left brachiocephalic arterial venous access uh, created. Um, uh, she presented uh, in April 2021 with thrombosis aneurysm of the cephalic vein, and she underwent resection with interposition grafting using PTFE. Uh, she was started on warfarin, and uh, on follow-up, she was found to have a pulsatile uh, vascular access. Uh, now, I will talk to you about her presentations uh, starting April 2021 and ending in October uh, 2022. So, this will spread over an 18 months uh, period. Um, so, so uh, uh, fistulogram at the time showed uh, uh, stenosis uh, in the uh, left uh, innominent vein as well as the uh, cephalic arch confluence with the subclavian uh, vein, and both were um, treated with high-pressure uh, balloon with good results, as you can see. However, she presented again in August uh, 2021 with high venous pressure during hemodialysis, edema of the left upper limb, and a fistulogram at the time showed a recurrence uh, of the uh, subclavian uh, and uh, and cephalic arch uh, tight uh, stenosis. These were uh, treated again with a high pressure balloon with good results. In October 2021, she presented with uh, edema, not just of the left upper arm, but also the left pectoral region. Uh, and fistulogram this time showed recurrence of the same lesion, um, uh, both in the subclavian and in the uh, innominate veins, both were treated again with high with high pressure balloons with uh, good results. In December uh, 2021, she again presented with recurrent symptoms, high recirculation uh, in the AV fistula, and uh, fistulogram uh, revealed uh, that the stenosis had come back, and uh, this time we uh, used. Uh, cutting balloon, eight millimeter cutting uh, balloon for uh, the lesion uh, uh, followed by high pressure balloon with good results. And in, uh, in March, 2022, again, she had recurrent symptoms. This time she has uh, varicose veins on the uh, left upper chest and uh, shoulder. And uh, same lesion is back. Uh, this time it was treated with a uh, plain balloon angioplasty with uh, good results at the time. However, she uh, kept coming back with symptoms of uh, uh, venous uh, hypertension of the left upper limb. Uh, this time in uh, April 2022, treated with balloon with good results. Uh, in June, she uh, uh, came back again and with the same lesions 
again plain balloon angioplasty was uh, performed with uh, good results um, now uh, so in june we did a ct venogram of the chest uh, just to make sure that there is nothing uh, space there's nothing uh, compressing the uh, central veins from outside and and sure enough the study was negative in august 2022 she had recurrent symptoms and signs of venous hypertension uh, and uh, so the the venogram uh, showed uh, recurrent uh, recurrence of the same lesions. Uh, this was treated with a uh, uh, cutting balloon uh, in both sides, followed by high pressure balloon. Mm -hmm. And this time we inserted a uh, stent in the uh, cephalic subclavian vein uh, confluence. Um, of course, because of uh, the many times that it, that this lesion had uh, recurred with a good results as you can see. In uh, September 2022, uh, she had, uh, the, in fact, the edema of the left upper limb was relieved. However, this time she presents with a uh, puffy face, uh, engorged neck veins, and uh, diagnosis of SVC syndrome. So we did a, a bilateral upper limb, uh, central uh, venography, which showed a patent left subclavian stent with excellent flow. However, there was a severe stenosis of the left innominate vein and total occlusion of the uh, distal uh, part of the right innominate vein just prior to uh, entrance to the uh, superior vena cava. Uh, balloon venoplasty was uh, performed uh, using high pressure balloon for the right first and then for the left uh, innominate veins with uh, with good radiological results at the time. However, two weeks later, she presented with recurrence of SPC syndrome. Uh, this is when we knew that the most that probably the most suitable uh, way to go at this point is to uh, use a stent. So we uh, so in so uh, in October 2022, we performed a, a bilateral uh, femoral vein uh, access. The left innominate vein was uh, crossed with relative ease. However, the right innominate vein was, was not crossed easily. Uh, finally, we crossed with the uh, O35 wire, hydrophilic wires, and both were advanced well into the upper limb veins. And uh, as you can see, so we did pre ballooning of both lesions, followed by a stent deployment simultaneously at the same time. This was uh, both, uh, each of them, sorry, was a uh, 14 by uh, 80 uh, millimeter stent. And this is a video of the final venogram after stent deployment showing uh, nice results. So what does the literature say about uh, central venous occlusions, which we know they are recurrent? The, Using a balloon angioplasty, the technical success is around 70 to 90 percent, with the patency rate, uh, primary patency at six months up to 63 percent, while cumulative patency at six months well, can be up to 100 percent, with massive variation, uh, as you can see in the numbers, uh, between the lower and the higher uh, range. At 12 months, the primary patency is up to 50% and the cumulative patency is up to 100%. So uh, we know from this that uh, plain balloon angioplasty actually works. Um, stenting, on the other hand, you have uh, bare metal stents, which is usually stainless steel and nitinol, and uh, there, is, there are no difference in outcome uh, between uh, the two. Uh, when we talk about uh, rescue stenting, this is used when you have an acute elastic recall of more than 50% following uh, uh, balloon angioplasty of the vein or recurrent stenosis within a three months period. The patency rate uh, for rescue stenting, uh, primary patency at three months uh, up to 100% and primary assisted is the same. Uh, but look at 12 months, primary patency is up to 73%, while primary assisted patency is 91%. So both are actually uh, good. Uh, do we stand primarily when you first go in and see the first lesion? 
the data about this uh, overlaps and if you think that stenting will solve the problem uh, once and for all you should think again because it is still associated with significant uh, re-intervention rate therefore it is not recommended as first line treatment uh, what about stent grafting uh, when they uh, there's uh, one large study that i found but is a little bit old in 2011 that compared the uh, uh, stent uh, stent grafting patency whether primary or primary assisted and as you can see that at uh, at, at in the beginning it's it's uh, it's excellent but at 24 months primary patency is 45 percent and primary assisted patency is around 75 percent uh, uh, and also in the same study that they found that patient with central venous occlusive lesions has significantly shorter patency rate than those with stenotic lesions and patients who did not have previous intervention had less re-intervention rate than patients with previous uh, angioplasty or stenting. Other forms of treatment, you can uh, do fistula banding or fistula, li or fistula ligation, uh, both of which, of course, will mandate uh, creating another uh, vascular access. You can do venous bypasses for these lesions, which is a surgery, um, and uh, you can do a costal clavicular decompression. Uh, some, some studies shows uh, a better uh, outcome uh, and improved patency rates of central veins with these procedures. And this is all I had uh, for you today. I'd welcome any questions in the question period. Thank you, Dr. Daffa. Um, Tarek? Yeah, please. Um, yeah, thank you very much. That was a very interesting talk. I've already made a note of a few questions to ask you later on. Um, so, our next speaker is going to be Dr. Bavesh Natha from Abu Dhabi. Uh, he's going to be talking about anticoagulation uh, post venous intervention. Good afternoon. Um, thank you for inviting me. Um, I've had I changed my talk a little bit and I sent this to Calvin um, earlier this week um, because my initial talk was as part of a few case presentations so it was really short um, and I know Martin had asked me to add something about uh, acute DVT so you know since I was changing it I've added a little bit of that into this talk so you can bear with me for a few minutes with that addition. So uh, with regards to DBTs and deep venous thrombosis, just a basic overview, we're going to classify them into acute and well, chronic. Um, chronic DBTs is not really a thing, but um, and in acute, we'll look at some classification systems, some of the complications and sequelae, and then the treatment. And, and these kind of are important points to go through because they lead into why we offer treatment and what sort of treatments we will offer. And then in terms of chronic or patients with chronic venous hypertensions, we'll look at patients with non-occlusive lesions and patients with post-thrombotic syndrome. And particularly, we'll touch on some of their treatment options and um, how we manage the anticoagulation or antiplatelet therapy thereafter. So acute DVTs, um, how do we classify? There's various ways of doing it. I tend to stick to things that are simple. Um, I like the anatomical classification of them. And again, here there's there's a variety of ways of they're done. So some people look at them as calf DVTs, and then DVTs involving the femoropopliteal segment, and then or DVTs involving the iliacs and um, common femoral veins. Um, more simple than this is distal DVTs and proximal DVTs. So distal is calf veins, not including the popliteal, and proximal is everything from popliteal up into iliacs. Another way of looking at it, which is also important, is looking at the etiology, whether it's a provoked DVT or an unprovoked DVT with acute DVTs. And these all bear relevance in terms of your treatment options and your management thereafter. In terms of complications or related problems, well, um, again, various ways of doing this. Um, we can look at acute and chronic. I tend to look at your symptomatology as mild or moderate. So the initial things of heaviness in the legs, swelling, pain, um, and then later on patients who develop post-thrombotic syndromes. And then your severe complications acutely would be your phlegmasias and your cerula dolens. And cerula is particularly mm -hmm. a surgical emergency. Uh, where there's um, you know, extensive venous thrombosis, which may lead to arterial um, impedance and, and uh, ischemia of the foot. The other complication which we commonly know is uh, pulmonary emboli that can happen. 
And uh, of note, and this is where the classification plays a role, that the total number of pulmonary emboli, including the patients who develop fatal emboli, uh, tend to be more, the numbers tend to be higher in patients with more proximal DVTs than in distal DVTs. So the algorithm, this is taken a lot of it's out of the European guidelines for managing acute DVTs and summarized into two tables. So I've put them into provoked DVTs, and we're excluding patients who are pregnant or have underlying malignancies. My basic rule is that unless there's a significant reason, most of them should have compression garments initially um, because of the swelling and the discomfort that they um, have. And normally in the very acute phase, you would recommend a limb elevation till the swelling subsides a little bit, but then compression garments. With patients with distal DVTs, so calf vein DVTs, there's two ways to treat them. So one is you could treat them just with compression and, um, and a follow-up duplex within seven to 10 days. The other option is to start them on anticoagulation and treat them for three months like you would any other provoked DVT. Um, the patients you would select for possible conservative management are those with very minimal symptoms, those who have good access to uh, healthcare facilities who can come back to your treatment, and those who have a good understanding of their treatment and what to expect and, and why you're managing them in this conservative way. Um, patients with proximal DVT, so FEMPOP and ILEX, all will require anticoagulation unless they've got a significant bleeding risk for a minimum of three months. And those patients with iliac vein involvement, as mentioned earlier in some of the talks, is that I would, if they're young, low bleeding risk, I would definitely have a conversation about any sort of declotting of the femoral and iliac segments. And, and there's various methods of doing that from surgical to um, endovascular, pharmacal or pharmacomechanical. Um, and we know, and this the reason for this is that we know in patients with iliofemoral DVTs, the risk of developing post-thrombotic syndromes ranges from anything from 30 to 50% in that group. With regards to the unprovoked DVT, um, the, those patients, again, I, I, most of them, I would start them on early compression uh, stockings or compression garments. Um, I would tend to earn the side of treating both distal and proximal patients with three months of anticoagulation. I, I would not be that adventurous to treat them, uh, follow them, the distal ones, follow them up in seven to 10 days. Um, the question comes in with these patients is who do you give extended treatment for and is there a benefit in extended treatment? Um, and the answer is, it's, well, it's not very clear. So th there's a few criteria which we can use um, towards the end of their three month treatment to make that decision. So one of the things is by uh, advocators that we can perform venous duplexes. And if we've got a significant residual stenosis uh, within the vein, we could consider prolonged anticoagulation if the bleeding risk is low. We can look at D-dimers. So there's a study done which shows that patients with persistently high D-dimers, particularly towards the end of the initial treatment period, are probably at a higher risk of developing a recurrent DVT. And so we can consider extending the anticoagulation at that stage. And then again, patients with known or patients with suspected thrombophilias or malignancy and lower bleeding risk would consider extended anticoagulation. Again, the treatment choices in, in these patients is very much, you know, you're balancing the risk of bleeding versus the risk of rethrombosis, and you've got to be careful to assess that properly. When it comes to our chronic patients, so chronic scarring within the veins, um, and again, there's two areas we're going to look at, patients with the non-occlusive and patients with post-thrombotic. Most of these patients, particularly with the post-thrombotic syndrome, will be using long-term um, anticoagulation, I mean, uh, compression garments, and most of them will be on long-term anticoagulation. Um, with both of these patient groups, if their symptoms warrant, we would uh, offer endovascular intervention. And the next question is about what do we do post-procedure? Because the inter endovascular intervention is just the first step of their treatment. The rest of the treatment is essential as well. So the anticoagulation use, the compression garment use, and the follow-up and surveillance, particularly in the PTS group, is paramount to in ensuring long-term success in this patient group. So if we look at the PTS group, so patients with uh, post-thrombotic syndrome, iliacs and IVC, first thing is we need to adhere to local VTE guidelines in terms of anticoagulation choice. It's very difficult to prescribe a certain form of anticoagulation because different places and different centers have access to different treatment modalities, and we need to be aware of that and, and follow those protocols. There are no good randomized control trials or multiple retrospective reviews giving us an answer to how do we manage these patients post 
stenting in PTS. There are there is, however, one really good paper, uh, which is a Venus consensus uh, document, which is uh, produced a few years back. And looking and reading through that, most of them, most of the authors would suggest using low molecular weight heparin for at least two to six weeks, followed by long term anticoagulation in this group of patients. Um, patients where you suspect a very high thrombotic risk and a low ble bleeding risk, some would advocate, or up to 40% would advocate adding aspirin to this group of patients in managing them. With regards to how I treat them or manage these patients, I would tend to give them at least two weeks of low molecular weight heparin, uh, followed by a Pixiban, uh, five milligrams BD for about six months. And then these patients will follow up on a surveillance program and get a scan at two weeks, again, six weeks, three months, and if those scans show that there's great results, um, there's no significant instant stenosis, um, the patient doesn't have an underlying thrombophilia, we could then consider downgrading their Pixaban dose to 2.5 milligrams BD for at least another six to 12 months. Um, where re-interventions are needed in this patients, um, I would stick to therapeutic at uh, Pixaban long-term and have at times, especially those with multiple re-interventions, added a short course of antiplatelets after the re-interventions. Uh, some, some centers also advocate using statins in these patients for the anti-inflammatory benefits. In patients with non-occlusive iliac lesions, um, again, the evidence is even more heterogeneous and more conflicting. Um, in low thrombotic risk patients, some um, physicians advocate for prophylactic anticoagulation or antiplatelet uh, anti agents periprocedural, and, and that be that. But the vast majority of venous experts tend to prefer at least one to three months of either dual antiplatelets or anticoagulation post stenting of a non-occlusive lesion. What I tend to do again is periprocedural, they'll get a, a low molecular dose of therapeutic dose of low molecular weight heparin and then be put on a Pixiban two and a half milligrams BD for about six weeks. Um, uh, if we are treating these nivel lesions as part of treating an acute DVT, um, then obviously we will anticoagulate them as per the protocol for the acute DVT for a minimum of three months. Um, so brief talk about our anticoagulation antiplatelets. Um, they can be broadly classified as um, heparins um, and then oral anticoagulants will be your vitamin K inhibitors such as warfarin and your, and your DOAX, your dor uh, direct oral anticoagulants. Mm -hmm. With regards to antiplatelets, um, there's no role of antiplatelets in managing acute DVT. Um, in post-stenting, as I said earlier, some studies show that there's some benefit in reduction of instant stenosis, uh, but it does increase your bleeding risk. With regards to heparin, again, broken up into two groups, unfractionated heparin, low molecular weight heparin, has been traditionally the initiation treatment for patients with acute DVTs um, and post-stent placement. Low molecular weight heparin um, obviously has the benefit that it doesn't require, generally doesn't require monitoring. Uh, theoretically, there's an anti-inflammatory and a thrombolytic property benefit to it compared to the warfarins. Um, Clexane is, the dosing is pretty simple. It's one milligram per kilogram BD or 1.5 milligrams per kilogram daily. And it's the only low molecular weight heparin that has been approved by the FDA in managing acute VTE in patients with severe renal failure at a reduced dose. With regards to our oral anticoagulants, I mean, this table demonstrates all of them that are available and most of their benefits and risks. The first four are your direct um, oral anticoagulants, um, and they they tend to be the mainstay in this day and age of your treatment, uh, your, your oral treatment of choice. Um, their benefits are obviously the pharmacodynamics is more stable, uh, three of them, apixaban, indoxaban, and rivaroxaban, have been advocated for use in patients with malignancy and thrombosis. Um, and my choice would be apixaban generally, just because of the ease of use. Uh, rivaroxaban is used widely. It just needs to be noted that the patients need to take it with meals to have good efficacy due to its lipid-soluble uh, absorption. Warfarin still has a role. Um, we know it works very well. Obviously, the drug and food interactions make it um, slightly more challenging to use. But in patients, particularly with underlying thrombophilia and a triple positive antiphospholipid syndrome, uh, warfarin may be the or warfarin is advocated by some hematologists as a drug of choice because you can make the patient well make the blood thinner, so that you you can increase the anticoagulation effect and can be monitored doing that. 
So these are my references, like I mentioned, in terms of the post-stenting, um, there's a good uh, review article, um, the European uh, Vascular Society guidelines with regards to treatment of acute DVTs, and then um, some of the, the guidelines from the Venus team at Guys and St. Thomas Hospitals has helped me kind of shape my practice as well. Thank you for your attention. Sorry, I pushed the wrong button there. Thank you very much, Baf. That was very interesting. It's 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 lovely hearing these different presentations because I had a few questions about anticoagulation regimes and whatnot. So you've answered quite a few questions, and uh, hopefully, I'm sure other people would like to engage uh, in a discussion with you about that. Um, so, Kelvin, who do we have next? We've got Doctor you know? Salam. There we go. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, Doctor Afat. Thank you for joining us. Oh, thank, you, thank, also, you thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Day. The opportunity to present. Um, I prepared some of cases. Uh, will be a quick um, lecture, uh, as we are dealing with uh, many of uh, dialysis patients and complications related to uh, hemodialysis access. I choose to um, present some of the of these complications. Here is a, um, a patient who was on permacath for a couple of years. Then a fistula was created, presented with uh, um, SVC syndrome. Um, we tried to access from the permacat side, as you see, it leads, it's, um, I don't know if you can see it here, small collaterals only. So um, we punctured from um, bilateral brachial approach. And as you see here, there's a total occlusion of the uh, right brachiocephalic vein. And welcome. No access to the SVC, so we continued from left, as you appreciate here, and see the occlusion again, and another access was created from the uh, right femoral vein, leading us close to the to the occlusion, and we were successful by um, putting the back end of the wire, uh, advancing it into the IVC, uh, into the um, right atrium at the end just to confirm that the catheter was in the right atrium followed by snaring the um, wire as you see here from below and getting it through access access through and through was ballooned and a covered stent, balloon mounted stent was placed, as you see here, with this result. Acceptable if you open one side, and that's what we decided to do. And the patient was um, doing dialysis fine. Three years later, he was presented again with um, malfunctioning right fistula. It was created on the right side, unfortunately. Um, severe edema of the right upper limb. Uh, came back again we might have lost uh refight for a second I got a backup so let me see if I can share the screen and then we'll just try and continue from there so bear with me a second. Okay. okay. We skip to where we were. Three, three years later, um, with uh, malfunctioning fistula. Unfortunately, fistula was created on the right side a severe edema of the right um, upper limb. So we just decided to go again from uh, right brachial um, approach and right femoral. Um, see here a total occlusion as demonstrated uh, previously in the same area uh, leading to the symptoms, maybe due to the high pressure of the fistula. Um, mm, Crossing that area with the conventional methods failed. So we placed a snare on um, 
in the right, in the upper part of the uh, right brachiocephalic vein and decided to go for sharp recanalization using transeptal needle uh, coming from femoral. The snare was targeted with the transeptal needle and the wire was advanced through it and the wire was, was uh, catched with the snare and again through and through axis. And you see here first balloon dilatation and after that placement of 14 millimeter uh, stent and we have the patency of uh, bilateral frequencephalic pains and SVC and the patient was discharged without any symptoms. The other case is Again, uh, complication after um, line, hemodialysis line, the right side was treated previously with uh, a stent in the right brachiocephalic vein, was presented uh, with severe facial swelling, uh, vascular tinnitus, and uh, chest wall collaterals. Um, same um, management. Uh, as you started usually with the venogram and see the occlusion of the, the stent and you see the stent is crushed due to the position of the stent actually uh, the dislocation is common uh, that you see the, the, the stent crushing here was uh, dilated with a 10 millimeter balloon and the uh, clinical symptoms uh, were better but not completely uh, resolved. The patient has persistent bilateral tinnitus and uh, left neck and arm swelling. So he was brought back again after one week, but this time under general anesthesia. And an access was made from uh, right and left and from uh, femoral as well. And we see here we have a, a stent to target. You don't have to place a snare or something like this. So you come closer to the uh, occlusion, to the stent with wire and catheter. And uh, once arrived there, we um, managed to get an access with the uh, outback. You see you're puncturing the stent and pushing the, the wire, catching it and with the, from the femoral sheet, through and through access again, uh, 12 millimeter balloon followed by uh, 12 millimeter um, Venovo stent. Facial swelling disappeared with no tinnitus anymore after the procedure. Uh, follow up after one year was uh, without any symptoms as well. This case is a female patient uh, was presented with the Methiana syndrome and uh, consequently. Um, thrombosis of the iliac veins and down to the uh, popliteal vein and the uh, posterior tibial vein uh, as well. Uh, discoloration, bluish discoloration, swelling of the left limb and as you appreciate here in CT as well, um, and bluish discoloration, pain. So the management was uh, to, um, the plan was to do a uh, directed, uh, catheter directed thrombolysis to start with, and then to see the patient on the next day. Access was made from uh, right uh, jugular. You see here, patency of the uh, SVC. And first of all, uh, infrarenal uh, IVC filter was placed and a catheter was advanced through the occlusion. You see here that, um, thrombus burden that was crossed down to the popliteal um, vein and uh, infusion catheter Greg McNamara was placed and the uh, patient was lysed overnight and brought back on the next day. And you see here a uh, small residual uh, thrombi were aspirated easily and the patency of the femoral uh, vein. Uh, this is a transpopliteal approach. Um, and the um, stenosis here through the methana syndrome was dilated and stented with 16 millimeter stent. And this is the final result with brisk flow and no complications. The filter was removed afterwards. Um, 
Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sarifa. There we go. Um, Tarek, would you like to continue? Um, I'm um, back. Sorry for that. What happened? My oh, no. internet was... Don't worry. It it all actually worked sudden. out very well. We carried on. Uh, Kelvin had your backup presentation, so he carried on yeah. from exactly where you stopped. It was and, great. And, and, and the timing was impeccable as well. So, uh, Rifat, we will we will continue with the presentations, and as as discussed earlier, we will uh, save the questions for later. So, Kelvin, yeah. So, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Ahmed Mordi, who is an interventional radiologist. Uh, he's also based in Bahrain. So, Ahmed, um, thank you for joining us. Hello, everybody. Okay, uh, you hear me. Yeah, very nice, loud and clear. Okay, let's see something. Okay, you uh, can see my screen now. Hello. Hello. Yes, we can see and we can hear you. Yes. Okay. Yes. okay. Uh, thank you, everybody. Here, uh, just a couple of cases uh, about Venus challenges concerning uh, the optimization of post-intervention treatment and how uh, it's done. Uh, here uh, is a lady uh, in her uh, late 30s. She is a physician. She has a DVT 12 years uh, ago on her uh, left lower limb. Uh, after that, she went into anticoagulation, but with uh, continuous severe pain, severe perfect pain, uh, heavy vaginal discharge, uh, heavy dysmenorrhea, uh, heavy dyspareunia. Uh, this pushed her into severe depression. She didn't, uh, she couldn't get um, a very specific treatment for uh, her condition. She came to our hospital and uh, she was diagnosed by May Turner syndrome on her left side. Uh, the challenge is that she was completed her family and she has uh, incidentally discovered adenomyosis with severe vaginal bleeding every uh, month. Uh, she get transfused twice. This pushed her into severe anemia all the time. Her hemoglobin didn't go uh, beyond seven all the time. Uh, she has intrauterine birth hormonal uh, device uh, and she also underwent uh, uh, for hormonal therapy for her adenomyosis. Uh, the challenges was about how to treat the maternal syndrome. Then I have to put a stent after that. After that, I have to uh, control the hypercoagulable state by anticoagulation. How I can give her anticoagulation with such a hormonal therapy against adenomyosis. So I offered her uh, hysterectomy before the procedure. She refused. Uh, okay, we have to remove this hormonal device. And after that, uh, we have to proceed with the treatment. The treatment was in, uh, in steps to treat the maternal syndrome itself by recanalization and stenting, uh, and to treat uh, the adenomyosis by embolization after removing the IOD and to prevent the hormonal therapy, uh, systemic hormonal therapy uh, by, uh, by, um, by uh, embolization and to go for birth control because she, is completed, she completed her family through fallopian tube uh, blockage. So here, uh, the city of her. Uh, I think, Ahmed, there is an issue with sharing screen. It appears as a blank white screen. Blank yes. white screen. Thanks for pointing that out, Ahmed. It's, it's come out now. It's blank. It has been slightly uh, interrupted, Ahmed. Have you got your screen? Have you got the CT scan yeah. up now, okay. Ahmed? Okay, you can see this now. Um, yes. Ye yes, we can see it now, yes. Okay. It's, it's an something about, about a video. Uh, forget about it. It's just for the CT. The CT showed the severe pelvic congestion syndrome and uh, uh, very severe chronic DVT. Here you can see a very old image from the DVT before 12 years ago. Fortunately, I get it. Here, MRI of her uterus showing the adenomyosis 
in her uterus and the thickening of the of the wall of the uterus. Here you can notice that the, the the iliac vein compressed by both iliac arteries. Here you can see vulvar uh, varicose veins. Sorry, Ahmed. Um, uh, sorry to interrupt, but the uh, we we can't actually see. Oh, okay, now we're seeing it. It so just takes point... some time. So shall I share my screen, maybe, and then I can move the slide for you. Okay, um, let me do that. Yeah, that's better because it's happening with all imaging. Yeah. So Ahmed, at least it will help you. So we'll we we will Kelvin will basically flick through your slides for you. So, okay. Okay. This is the slide now. Okay, Kelvin, you have you have the video. You can show them the video if you need this one. Yeah. Will that play? Oh, it doesn't play, but let me see. Um, I only have this uh, image. These are just images, so I don't have the video, sorry. Okay, no problem. No problem. Just go for the images, please. Okay. Um, it, just the, the MRI? Yep. All right. Yeah. I can it's still clearing. Yeah. They're all single slides. I, I'm not too sure. Is that? Here, the MRI. Yeah. Okay. The MRI shows adenomyosis. And yeah. the, uh, the second image after the MRI showing uh, May Turner syndrome, compressed, uh, the compressing uh, the, the vein is compressed, the iliac vein is compressed by both iliac arteries. The second, the third image is showing uh, vulvar varices in the in the pelvis here. Yeah. The so, last image is reconstructed maximum intensity projection images, uh, and this showing a chronic DVT. You can compare the left side with the right side. Here, I'm I'm always using on those patients. I using direct CT uh, venogram, uh, inserting a cannula in uh, in the foot of the patient. And the injecting contrast through the, the 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 foot itself. Here you can notice at the very uh, distal at the very proximal part of connection between the iliac uh, vein and the IVC. You can notice calcification, uh, indicating very long uh, term May Turner uh, syndrome compression. After that, you can see you can see a three D image showing um, a draining collaterals from left to right, and you can see the running collaterals through the, uh, the, the anterior abdominal wall in front of the bladder and above and behind the bladder at different levels. Okay, the treatment was a dilemma. I told you before, the patient that completed her family but uh, wanted to keep her uterus, so we have to recanalize uh, and insert the stent and then start the anticoagulation. The problem here, she has adenomyosis. She, uh, this adenomyosis mandate her to go with hormonal therapy all the time and contraceptive pills. This pushed her into hypercoagulable state. I thought this will uh, put our stent into failure. So uh, I have to prevent her from hormonal treatment. This will may make her pregnant again. So the steps was like that to recanalize and to stent the pelvic congestion syndrome, I have to block both ovarian veins because she has symptomatic severe pelvic congestion syndrome in the form of severe vaginal uh, varices, severe vulvar varices, uh, severe vaginal, ble uh, severe vaginal uh, secretions, and the abnormal distribution of varicose veins on her left side. Um, also, she has severe vaginal bleeding every month I have to embolize both uterine arteries. I have to control her birth by fallopian uh, tube coiling. Then I have to start, uh, I have to put her on Eliquis for six months. Here you can see the image uh, of uh, chronic total occlusion of ilia, of iliocaval uh, junction. Actually, I'm not pushing my patients with such problems into popliteal axis. I actually going through the right and left basilic veins with the, with greater saphenous vein axis. I'm I'm not in love with the popliteal uh, with the popliteal uh, axis because some some self concerns about it. Here you can notice the varicose veins is running from, from the left to right through the pelvis. 
Here you can notice the vulvar varices by imaging and how it's stabled for the veins. I'm coming from up from the right basilic and left basilic veins in the R. Here you can notice the pelvic varices related to the ovarian vein. After we, uh, we put a stent here, you can notice the IOCD. You have to re remove this IOD from her. Uh, I inserted on both sides stents after the canalization, and then I uh, blocked her ovarian veins. This was not to treat the pelvic uh, congestion syndrome because the stent will treat that. But because I noticed when I tested her ovarian veins by blocking by balloons, that the flow becomes uh, uh, higher in, in velocity and the amount inside the, the, the affected side. So I the decision was to block everything inside the pelvis, including her ovarian veins. Here, a picture after. Then um, there is a video also. I don't know if it's you can see it uh, after. Kelvin, you have a video or not? It's not playing the video. Okay. Um. Okay. So that the, here a picture of fallopian tube coiling after the insertion of stents. The second the image here, a typical picture of corkscrew uh, arteries for adenomyosis. So I blocked this uterine artery on the right. Here after uh, embolization of the uterine artery. Uh, here also you will find on the left side here the uterine artery on the left side corkscrew uh, arteries pathognomonic for adenomyosis so I embolized this uh, so here also the final image after embolization of the left side here you can find the final image you will find both stents I started uh, recanalization of everything from uh, from the femoral art from the femoral vein up to the IVC and I put stent graft on the other side because I noticed when I put stent on the on the left side the right side went into a small uh, uh, small caliber so I I noticed this in many patients with maternal syndrome uh, I always check the contralateral side after stenting the affected side. Here you can notice um, coils embolizing both ovarian veins, and you can notice coils in, uh, blocking both fallopian tubes. Uh, here, uh, this is before and this is after the patient. And now here, you can notice the steps of the treatment. One, it's stenting. So it's ovarian vein embolization to push more blood to run through the affected uh, limb. Three, bilateral fallopian blockage to birth, to control birth. Fourth was a uterine adenomyosis to prevent more bleeding. That is uh, necessita necessitating uh, treatment of anemia and push the, uh, our treatment into failure. Um, there is a second patient uh, with it, it's uh, it's an interesting case. It's a second patient with recurrent varicocele, and actually he has benign venous embolization to treat his varicocele. He's a gentleman in his thirties. He has a severe scrotal pain, incapacitating after varicocelectomy about two years ago. Um, this pain has a specific uh, presentation. This pain becomes incapacitating during ejaculation and uh, during erection. So he has a recurrent grade four varicocele. After that, uh, the treatment was to check everything, the varicocele. And uh, during the varicocele uh, checking by Andrew, I noticed that uh, everything is done from uh, his arm like that. I'm not doing varicocele from the neck or the femoral. So here he has reflux on both sides, severe reflux with grade four. And here you can notice the running uh, image to the greater saphenous vein. Also here, severe varicocele. After that, I embolized. Here you can notice that collateral is running from the varicocele itself to the centurine plexus of veins of the penis and running to the contralateral side. So I went to uh, the centurine plexus after embolizing the varicoceles and uh, did uh, a cavernosogram. The cavernosogram showed 
there is a severe uh, leakage from this uh, plexus into the varicocele of the of both sides. So the treatment here was to block the venous uh, leakage from the penis to prevent the recurrence of the varicocele and to treat him from pain. Uh, here also the penile centurini plexus uh, during immobilization. I'm always using uh, in such cases uh, uh, balloon occlusion to test the, the flow and to uh, force the flow to open the unseen channels that can be blocked during the procedure and to put the patient uh, venous system under uh, stress and under pressure. So here you can see the bilateral balloon occlusion of both uh, iliac uh, and, uh, and the internal pudendal veins. Here you can notice after occlusion and uh, venogram, you can notice that there is still leakage through the sacral venous plexus that's connected also with the varicocele. Um, I injected the uh, sclerosins through the balloon after occlusion and uh, blocked everything. So here you can notice that collateral running from the varicocele to the, the Santorini plexus of veins of the penis is no more there. Everything was treated and the patient, the patient went home just from, uh, uh, from a skin hole in his, uh, in his arms like that with a band-aid immediately after the procedure without the uh, hospital staying. Uh, here, please uh, enjoy uh, your life and uh, pray for peace all over the world. Thank you, everybody. Fantastic presentation Fantastic. and some mind-blowing cases presented here today. Um, thank you very much, Ahmed, for that. Um, um, I would like to now invite our next speaker, uh, Dr. Shagran Bishamis, who is a consultant interventional radiologist based in Saudi Arabia in Riyadh. And uh, thank you for joining us, Shagran. And uh, you may proceed. Oh, hi. <clears throat> hi, good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's great to be here. And uh, of course, I'd like to thank uh, Martin, Calvin, and Tarek for organizing uh, this event in memory of our uh, friend, uh, late uh, Dr. Hassan. Um, so I'm going to be showing uh, um, an interesting case um, in terms of uh, an association of something that we usually see in terms of Maytherner, uh, but an association that's not very common uh, to see. So we'll start by uh, the case presentation. So this is an elderly male who's diabetic and hypertensive. He's had a left hip replacement around six years back. One year post-procedure, he developed severe lower limb edema. And at his local hospital, an ultrasound showed an acute DVT where we don't have a report of mentioning where the DVT was exactly. They also did a lymphocentigraphy, which was normal. At the time, he was treated with anticoagulation and uh, compression stocking as in, in terms of the standard treatment protocol. A few years after that, he developed uh, progressive swelling and heaviness. Then he was referred to our hospital at the time. So when we saw him and we examined him, he was in a wheelchair. He couldn't walk because of the severe swelling, reaching up to the groin and scrotum. Um, his neurovascular exam was normal, and luckily he didn't have any advanced uh, uh, features in terms of ulceration or bleeding or any signs of ischemia. This was his leg at the time. You can definitely see the massive swelling with the large varicosities, as well as uh, skin pigmentation and thickening in the lower leg. So in these kind of cases, it's always good to think, what's the next workup? So we know he has a history of DVT. We know at the time his lymphocytography was normal. Uh, so what is the typical workup for these kind of patients? So you can either go for either Doppler ultrasound only, checking also for insufficiency, doing a lower limb venogram or a CT. Um, at our institution, for any patients with chronic DVT, we usually would do all of the above. So we double check the, uh, the whole venous system as well as insufficiency because it's good to know before the procedure if he has an insufficiency and to see if that insufficiency improves after the procedure. We also like to do a lower than venogram, preferably a conventional venogram to check the inflow, to check the profunda, and to check the saphenous veins. 
And of course, we definitely need to do a CT or MR at least to check the status of the iliac veins as, as well as the IVC. So here you can see the CT, it's gonna be running a little bit fast. This is an arterial phase CT. So as you can see, there's a funny area where you can see in the region of the internal iliac vein, we'll go back to that. So what would we see here? If we can just play it again and then we'll see. So if we focus on the iliac region, so what would we say here? Would we say that this is a May-Thurner syndrome with an occluded common iliac vein? It's probably not that simple. Definitely not the normal CT, but for sure you can see early filling of the venous system in the left lower limb with large collaterals in the lower abdominal wall and scrotal region. So the answer here would be one and three. If we, go, if we dig a little bit deeper into the findings, so he has an occluded common iliac vein with definite compression here on the side. He has May-Thurner morphology. He has a large network of communication between the internal iliac artery or the iliac arteries, as well as the occluded common iliac vein. And his lower limb veins here, because of the reflux or the filling and the arterial phase, you can see that they're widely patent. So then here, the next step we went for conventional venograms, you can see confirming from the left side that the common iliac vein is occluded with large cross-filling collaterals. On the image here on the arteriogram, this is just showing from the external iliac artery that there's almost nothing uh, filling into that funny area that we were looking at into in the CT. So this is the area I'm talking about in the CT where you can see this funny network of channels between the ar iliac artery and vein. And this is when we inject a bit more proximal into the internal iliac artery. You can see this funny uh, blush here in the region of the iliac artery. So our diagnosis here was methanol morphology with an arteriovenous fistula. So the treatment approach was one of four, either just conservative treatment, which definitely we weren't going for that because of the severe symptoms. Then do we treat only the, uh, the shunt that we see or the fistula? So that will decrease maybe his swelling. Or do we do venous recanalization alone and see how he does? Or do we do both? Do we recanalize his venous system as well as embolizing the shunt, hoping to decrease his symptoms as fast as possible? So we were debating between starting only with the recanalization and wait or doing recanalization and embolization. In the end, we decided that we're gonna go for embolization as well as recanalizing the venous system. So the recanalization procedure was relatively straightforward. It's only a short occlusion of his common iliac vein. Uh, the wire crossing wasn't complicated. So this is not really the goal of the case. And then we put some coils in his internal iliac artery uh, the outflow, and then we started injecting some onyx to try to fill some of the channels here, as you can see uh, in the video. So as a procedure per se, um, it wasn't very complicated. Uh, the planning was relatively straightforward. But just the main, try, try, try to highlight the main um, factor here in the procedure where you can see this funny shunt uh, between the artery and the vein. This is the final images. You can see from the arteriogram that there's no uh, further filling of the uh, AV fistulas or the shunts that we were seeing before. And the venogram shows uh, widely patent uh, inflow as well as outflow. I didn't show pictures of his lower limb veins, but the lower limb veins were patent as well. Post procedure, we put him on compression stockings. We give them very strict walking regimens. And usually patients that are immobile or cannot walk, we don't offer as many procedures just uh, because we know that the uh, stent patency will be significantly reduced. So we usually ask them to walk 10 minutes every hour while they're awake. And we notice it helps a lot. We put them on minoxaparin uh, for a short period of time, as well as at least one antiplatelet agent, depending, of course, on their bleeding risk. And then later we switch them to uh, direct anticoagulants. So the good point of discussion here would be the anticoagulation protocol. It was uh, beautifully presented uh, earlier by our colleague from Abu Dhabi. Uh, as we know, this, there's no real straight uh, protocol. However, there's a lot of consensus out there. On the follow-up, uh, two weeks, his leg uh, swelling reduced almost back to normal. As Martin said previously, these patients really improve really fast. And his ultrasound showed a patent stent. And then three months later, 
uh, he did uh, very well. And you can see here on the CT, again, as an arterial phase, um, you can see the stent is patent, minimal intimal thickening. And there's still some filling uh, of the venous uh, system in the arterial phase. He has some hypertrophy to median sacral artery, which was uh, shunting still. And at the time, we decided to leave that. That could help uh, with uh, maintaining the patency of the stent. And he had no cardiac issues, so we're not really afraid of having any uh, heart failure related to this minimal residual shunt. So uh, in conclusion for the case, uh, I think it's uh, not a very common to see uh, associated chronic DVT with shunting. But as we know, one of the physiological ways of the body to uh, try to recover from DVTs is developing some shunts. And there are some case reports of a fistulas uh, post uh, DVT. And uh, we think that decision to treat the fistula as well as the iliac vein occlusion simultaneously uh, gave the best results. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Shagran. That was great. Um, so a fantastic uh, presentation. Very interesting case. Amazing. So, Tarek, what we'd like to do now is go straight to the roundtable discussion. Um, Martin, I, I believe you've got some burning questions. Shall we start with you? Yeah, thank you, Kiran. I Yeah, I have a couple of remarks and many, many questions. Uh, let's see how uh, how far we can go and how many we can answer. So in the regard of the, yeah, they, we have seen really fantastic cases. And thank you very much to all speakers, like for perfect preparation. Uh, we have seen a different, uh, you know, um, we have seen management of different pathologies. We have seen the management of like reflux and valvular disorders. Uh, we have seen the management of the obstructions, which are basically two major pathologies in the venous bed. Uh, I first remark regarding the regarding the imaging, and I mentioned this in my introduction speech, is that it, you know the venous bed is very tricky. Uh, so the use of of axial or uh, or the images of uh, MRV and CT venography, as we used to use it in the arterial system, uh, they are necessary in many cases in the venous pathologies as well. But the problem is uh, these are not dynamic images, and the, uh, you know uh, we don't miss this in the arterial bed, but in the venous bed we miss this because. The, the blood direction uh, might be, you know, var various in, in, in the venous bed, which is not the case of the arterial. Uh, that's why the uh, ascending venography is so important, but the ascending venography, again, uh, in case of occlusion might be also tricky because you get the dynamic image, but uh, uh, in case of obstruction, you might in some cases just not see anything else than, than just a plexus of, uh, of the of the collaterals. That's why the, the IVOS is, is essential in, in these cases as well. So uh, I can I share can I share my screen? I will just want to show you one uh, just to as a reaction to uh, Ahmed's uh, uh, talk regarding the IVC filter. Uh, we need the, we need IVC filters for the many cases of the floating IVC thrombus as he fantastically illustrated on his case and uh, so he in, in introduced the in the IVC filter prior to the procedure and he kept it even for the procedure of the uh, uh, surgery later on I, this is just a suggestion what I did for one of my case also the case of the young patient with a floating thrombus instead of IVC filter I have used semi-deployed uh, wall stand which is the only only stand mm -hmm. on the market you can uh, pull back into the into the sheet yeah there is no other stand so I I have used 22 uh, millimeter wide uh, uh, wall stand inject uh, inserted from the jugular and if you can see here when, while I was doing very high risk uh, ballooning after thrombectomy and thrombolysis here on the on the upper part you can see the semi-deployed uh, wall stand and this is uh, you know this is a detail here uh, 
this is how it looks like this is after the suction from the stand itself and the retraction so the advantage of this trick is that you know you use it as an ivc filter only for a limited time of the procedure itself so you don't leave anything you don't uh, leave anything behind that's the that's just a small trick uh, I, now the couple of questions so the question sorry for before the, that martin that was actually a very interesting point because that's almost behaving like the anaris clot retriever so actually it's it's a very very good 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 suggestion yeah, just, there yeah just a small trick i've learned and now the uh ahmed just meant uh touched the question about the timing of the intervention and it's very very interesting because this is something i we have learned during our journey uh so the ad advice uh overall advice when uh you know how to tackle the acute dvt is to go for thrombolysis or, or thrombectomy within the first two weeks but as we grow our practice i've seen cases when you know much older than two weeks and and we intervene and very success successfully so nowadays we are inflating these two weeks up to almost like six weeks for for the for um, for the treatment of of because six weeks is already like subacute DVT. Yeah? But uh, in case of of thrombolysis, we really can get a good result with these cases as well. So uh, this is my question for the for the table. It's like. Uh, do you do you strictly go you know go for the intervention only for the two weeks and less or you intervene for the cases uh, older than two weeks of dvt and then for the cases of of stenting of course uh, there is a lot of questions there uh how about this is educational workshop so for for our attendees the question is uh, how about the pregnancy when you use the stents for the young females uh, do you uh, instruct them or uh, how how do they manage the the, the pregnancy and uh, and the issue with the stenting that's the second uh, and the third one is uh, I, again it was fantastic presentation by Bavish about the, the man management post stenting the anticoagulation uh, many patients are very young patients yeah we we put the stent for uh, and many of these patients are either want to escape of the long-term anticoagulation or asking about cannot we just uh, switch to aspirin after some time so what does it mean long-term anticoagulation after stenting let's say you know you put the stent and the patient you i totally agree with low molecular weight heparins for two weeks also with the anti-inflammatory aspect of this uh, then we put the patient on, on uh, usually on oral treatment uh, i still believe warfarin is perhaps the best but it's not suitable for everyone so nowadays we use more and more of apixabans i've seen a couple of uh, retrombosis on zarelto uh, not very happy with with the treatment of of, of zarelto for the venous uh, venous cases there is not enough uh, data in the literature that's why i'm asking this question to the to the round table is Excellent. there any role of antiplatelet let's say after two or five years post stenting and uh, Thank so, you very much, guys. Yeah, thanks a lot. Involved. Thank you for summarizing all of that, Martin. So, so basically, we've got three questions, and then there are a few other. And I think if we stick to one comment from each of the speakers, um, that will allow us to to collate as many and go through as many questions as possible. So, very quickly on the whole subacute period, I think I would like to qualify that question uh, with stating: um, Are we speaking speaking strictly about thrombolysis alone or other methods of? um thrombectomy in the no. acute slash subacute phase the other the other possibilities as well the thrombolysis is the perhaps the safest one but like uh also to push the catheter and try to suck it out the thrombus is it like strictly for two weeks and less or uh, are you intervening even you know in like one month or thrombus so so what do our speakers um have to say on that so can i take that uh, question Tarek? please yes Ahmed, go ahead yeah. Yeah, uh, that's a very interesting question, and thank you for bringing it up on the table. Um, because we we have to admit that most studies have the uh, present in the literature in the current uh, currently are all done were done on catheter directed thrombolysis with lytic injected, and this has the most literature available nowadays still. 
Uh, so the, two, the, the, the cutoff point of two, three weeks was based on having a lytic infused overnight, and then you, you go and see the success of removal of the clot. However, there, there is increasing evidence that using the new tools we have on the block, whether with the ECOS catheter, having ultrasound or uh, assisted, can we say assisted lysis catheters, I think uh, we need more data in order to see if we we can strictly uh, stick to the the three weeks time. However, having said that, uh, we have to 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 differentiate, and that's for the attendees, for the young attendees, that in the first three weeks you are dealing with the clot. After the third week, you are dealing with the clot as well as the inflammatory reaction that happened in the endothelium as well. Mm. So that that actually might change things a little bit because you have an inflamed wall that started the, the process of having what we know afterwards as post-thrombotic syndrome. So it starts with right. inflammation. So you're, you're becoming the more pro-thrombotic at that time as well yeah. because yeah. of the inflammation. Yeah. So, so we still have the best results. We cannot argue that in the first three weeks. Uh, there are some tricky things after the third week that happens in the endothelium itself that renders it. Uh, uh, the results not as good as removing the clot early on. However, we, having the new technologies around the block with the mechanical thrombectomy, Precisely. that might change things a little bit. Precisely. And I think that you've basically answered my question because I was going to ask you, do, do you think that that we are um, it, we can potentially increase that period because you're combining lysis with much more advanced um, mechanical thrombectomy techniques. And, and, and we've seen the results of that from various studies and trials. Um, um, any, does anyone else have another comment based on that point? Thank you very much, Ahmed. No, I personally agree with uh, Dr. Ahmed uh, and uh, what Martin, uh, a good point that uh, Dr. Martin had brought up. But I think um, the, the longer you wait or the longer is the clock time, the less chance or less likelihood of success of your procedure. So mm -hmm. two weeks is great, three weeks maximum, I wouldn't push it further. Even if you've got yeah, the newer yeah. devices? Yeah, well, it depends which, because some of the newer devices are used for fresh clots and some for uh, so, sub, you know. Subacute, yeah. You know, yeah, subacute, not so, not so fresh. So, yeah. but, I wouldn't go for, after four weeks. I will not uh, try this. I I may go for uh, for like recanalization when it's chronic if they have still have symptoms. Yes. Uh, but that but that's a different story. Sure. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right, and that's the kind of practice I've seen as well. Um, because then you wonder if you're already going into the um organized phase of all the clot and everything so really you are going to treat this more as of a chronic but as you said i think we should watch this space because with advances in technology maybe some devices are coming up um and we'll just see what the data shows with regards to that um i'll quickly move on to the next point raised by uh, martin about pregnancy and pregnancy associated management um, whether it's regards to stenting or whether it's regards to anticoagulation, et cetera, et cetera. So for, for um, I mean, um, we very interesting points which were raised. So um, would anyone like to, to make a comment about that? Uh, you mind if I take it? Yeah, go for it. So in terms of pregnancy, I think it's a much more complicated issue to deal with. So usually we would put our patients in two categories. So the patients that still want to have uh, children and the patients that don't want to have children, that's one category. And then the other category would be the severity of the symptoms. So let's say you have a patient that has uh, very severe symptoms, um, then we would be a bit more aggressive. There are lots of studies proving that females can get pregnant even in the presence of uh, stents, but still the numbers are not that uh, good. But I would uh, be very aggressive and, and advocate uh, treating these patients if they have very severe uh, debilitating symptoms. Um, patients that don't want to have kids, that's of course a different story. But yeah. that's if they have only mild to moderate symptoms, I would usually uh, push them to have uh, either to decide to stop having children or to say that uh, come back to me when uh, they have uh, completed uh, their uh, child uh, birth in terms of how many kids they want to have. That's usually our protocol of how we would treat the patients 
that's yeah, that's a great answer, Shagran. And I and I, yeah. our practice is the same. And the literature, the data from the literature actually uh, prove that the the pregnancy and 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 stand go go together. So the question is perhaps the low molecular weight heparin coverage for the let's say last six weeks or or during the the delivery itself this is but for this we still don't have a data but it definitely it's not a contraindication and there is no point of scaring uh, the the females when uh, post stenting when they get pregnant yeah there is this is definitely not a indication for for uh, abortion of or, or any kind um, a slightly yeah, different question, to call but... yeah sorry like for parental coagulation like we have a good protocol uh, with mm -hmm. our colleagues in gynae as well as hematology, they follow up the patients uh, very well with low, low molecular weight heparin, uh, pretty much throughout the whole pregnancy. And sometimes they add antiplatelets depending, and they they follow them very closely every two weeks uh, in high risk mm -hmm. pregnancy units. Excellent. That's very interesting, Shogran. Have you noticed patients who've um, who've come in with say chronic pelvic congestion syndrome, secondary to? M.A. Therner, and have you seen patients or, or within this cohort who have been subfertile as a consequence of that? And have you noticed that uh, that their fertility is actually increased after venous stending and improving the pelvic congestion? Uh, we've had a couple of patients that actually did become pregnant after, as you said. So mm -hmm. that proves your theory in terms of getting uh, improved uh, fertility. I don't know really exactly the physiology. I haven't read up about it that well, but uh -huh. definitely as yes, we've seen it before. That's interesting. That's interesting. Yeah, I, I have comment concerning that. Uh, I'm yeah. conducting study with my team um, in relation to that topic of maternal and pelvic congestion syndrome in patients with gynecological issues. We found uh, a lot of uh, those patients, actually we did now nine cases of this study. Actually, we found uh, that uh, this this ladies um, has some sort of abnormal vaginal bleeding when we go for MRI. Most of them we found uh, adenomyosis. I don't know why. So we treated the adenomyosis. We treated the maternal syndrome. We treated the pelvic congestion syndrome. Mm -hmm. Most of them um, uh, was subfertile. Yes. Most of those ladies get pregnant for some reason. Yeah. Maybe for the treatment of the adenomyosis, maybe the treatment of uh, of pelvic congestion syndrome itself. We noticed that uh, the type of uh, running collaterals inside the pelvis of these ladies is much more related to collaterals, intrauterine collaterals and parauterine collaterals related to their uh, tubes. We, doesn't, we don't have any clue about... Uh, uh, if we include these collaterals, this will improve their uh, their fertility or not. But actually, mm -hmm. we notice that they have long history of uh, subfertility after that they treat it. We don't know why. It's, it's interesting because, as you mentioned, yeah. there are several confounding factors here, and it's difficult to isolate and separate each of the factors which may be contributing. Yeah. Um, I'll just quickly move on to some other points here because um, I've got a few other questions, um, and we want to finish on time so that um, Ahmed can deliver a speak, uh, a talk, uh, the final deliver the final talk. So the the last one, I think, just quick comments, quick points, really about post stenting. Now, um, Bav had an excellent presentation on this. And I think that's really important that this is covered. So any comments about the um, anticoagulation regime following? And I guess someone some would ask even during treatment because um, has anyone's practice changed over the years um, in terms of intra procedural and post procedural management? And 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 the point about what 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 do you define really? as, as long term um, Therapy and I, I'm, I'm sure all of us are also thinking about the thrombophiliacs as well as a as probably a separate category to that, but who obviously would require long term treatment. So the non thrombophilics uh, is that correct, Martin, which you were alluding to, um, who may require long term uh, treatment anticoagulation. What what do you define? How do you define long term? Yeah, this was the question because I have a couple of patients, you know, they just deliberately stop the, the yeah. treatment after some time because they they say, you know, after three, five years, we feel it's like obsolete, even despite like your advice for, for lifelong yes. treatment very often. 
uh, they just stop it and, and in many cases nothing is happening. So in that case, I'm, I, I, I try to convince them at least for antiplatelet, uh, but without having really strong evidence in hand. Mm. Excellent. So what have you seen? Have you got a number, Martin, of your cases? No, no, no. I, from my personal experience, but there is, it's not like the statistically significant number. I've seen a couple of rethrombosis uh, of his patients on rivaroxaban, and I, I stopped prescribing it in, in okay. this indication. And I have a couple of patients we just shifted the patient on antiplatelet, uh, mono, mono uh, antiplatelet treatment management with aspirin only. And nothing happened either. So, you know, this, but this is just like, you know, the personal experience. Excellent. That, that's very if I may something, if I may say something quickly, it depends. Yeah. I mean, whatever you do to these patients for recanalization or thrombectomy, thrombectomy whatever is the intervention, your, your post intervention uh, anticoagulation regimen should be based on the cause of the DBT. Or the cause of the the occlusion, the initial cause, if it's mm. provoked, or non-provoked. Yeah. If it's non-provoked, then you have to give them anticoagulation for Absolutely. longer longer time. And I have seen patients who stopped or even changed to DOAX, believe it or not, come back with with uh, a new DVT, which is which is crazy. So so I put them back as Martin uh, likes on warfarin, or uh, sometimes uh, a pixaban, although. The literature is not uh, big on this, but I feel apixaban and and warfarin are both, you know, good. If it if it was uh, if it was something, uh, you know, uh, it was if let's this is say if it's if it was provoked, then the period of anticoagulation is less. Yeah. And if you put a if you put a stent, then you have to just keep them on uh, antiplatelets for a long time. Very interesting. But that's my practice. Very interesting. Very interesting. Yeah, I think. If you don't mind if I have a yeah, comment. Go ahead, Shagran. So I think uh, as we talked about anticoagulation, uh, I think one important point is making sure that the patients are well anticoagulated before the procedure uh, and not Absolutely. stopping it before the, uh, during the procedure. And then the second point, I know we talk a lot about anticoagulation and all this kind of things. There are some patients that no matter what you do, they will three thrombose no matter what you do. Mm. It's something around their physiology or their thrombophilia or whatever. But I Probably one of the very important things that people don't discuss and talk about a lot is actually the patient's compliance and the patient's functional status. Yes. So mm -hmm. the patients that are healthier, that very compliant, that will walk, that will exercise, that will wear their stockings, uh, those are the patients that we notice that actually do much better, uh, even with less anticoagulation. And we've noticed in these kind of patients that uh, the stent, if it stays open for one year or two years, they usually they stay open for forever. Uh, mm -hmm. The patients that start the rethrombosing or restenosis in the first year, we know that these are the patients that are going to thrombose and not going to stay open and have so many recurrent symptoms all the time. So I don't know what's the magic solution for uh, for these kind of patients, but th that's a very important point. I think it's not very discussed that often. No, I think you're um, right. And, I, and as you said, it is, we know it's multifactorial. So as you said, those who are absolutely compliant, you're getting fantastic results, but those who aren't, you're seeing recurrence and uh, incident. So maybe, you know, the compliance is an issue, maybe the importance of stockings and exercise, et cetera, et cetera. And the other aspects um, uh, are not always followed, um, you know, quite strictly. So- uh, Sorry, can I, can I yes. make one comment on that? So, so we, there's a few articles- Last comment, please. Get, yeah. yeah, sorry, a few articles will get published hopefully soon, but there's a little bit of, um, points that have been mentioned which are quite true. So in terms of the surveillance, the, the fact that there's a, there's a study being shown that patients who have less than a 30% stenosis within the two and six week scan, are they, they are likely to do better. So that's one of the things. So um, the, you know, the point that early surveillance, if they survive a year, they tend to do better long term. And one of the things we were looking at, a lot of the patients who had multiple re-interventions, re-stenosis in, in the PTS group, was that, yes, compliance is a thing, but the main thing which seems to be an overriding thing is, is the inflow. So the yeah. assessment of, if they've got poor inflow, they do Absolutely. badly, even if they're completely compliant. So, so that tends to be the, the, the overriding factor. Absolutely. Thank you very much on that note. I mean, I've got loads of questions to ask, but in the interest of time and 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 to respect the time given to us by our faculty, um, we'd like to, I'd like to, Allow, I would like my colleague, um, uh, Dr. Tan, Kelvin Tan, to present the last speaker and, and, and what this really is about. So thank you, first of all, everyone, for your fantastic presentations. I will be 
messaging you uh, to because I've got a list of questions which I haven't um, I haven't asked. Uh, but Kelvin, can you take it from here now? Thank you. Oh, yeah. Th thank you, everyone, for your excellent presentation. Um, so for this last bit, we just want to remember Isam, you know, our dear friend. So we've got Professor um, Rafat Nag Nag Nagar here with us. Um, would you like to say a few words before uh, Garish move on? Yes, uh, thank you. I want to thank you all for uh, that excellent meeting. Actually, uh, today uh, I say a few words and then uh, I thought that some friends as well for uh, Professor uh, Asam Osman are uh, with us. I uh, thank Dr. Rafat Naga. Uh, he's a professor, well-known professor in, uh, in, in Egypt, and uh, I'm not sure if he is uh, still there. But he kindly sent us his video uh, saying a few words about uh, Tom Osman. And um, so a few words, I prepared some few words that I want to share with you um, because we gather to remember and honor the life of uh, Tom Osman. We all love this man and I will share his, yeah. So, so as we reflect on his journey as the... Um, as a great vascular surgeon, of course, we are reminded of the profound impact he had on the, on our field and the countless lives he saved during his life. As some, uh, I have to say, was not only a skilled surgeon, but also an exceptional, compassionate healer as well. He, is, he was dedicated to his patients. And um, I have to say, having him treated my father once upon a time, uh, that he approached uh, his patients with the utmost professionalism, expertise, and care. And I personally felt that in every, we spent a month with him, uh, um, that was about 10 years ago, as my father's doctor. And also those who worked with uh, Tom um, testified that his precision in the operating room even in the most extreme difficult times was remarkable. So beyond also his exceptional medical skills uh, that everybody knows, he was a true mentor and leader, having been my mentor myself, and he helped me a lot during my career. Um, we all saw him in every scientific gathering, generously sharing his knowledge and expertise, and that shape that definitely shaped the next generation of vascular surgeons, which I consider one of his um, um, one of his students, uh, honorably saying that um, his his guidance and encouragement and willingness to teach uh, were instrumental in in the professional growth of many of us who are gathered today, but. It wasn't just his professional achieve achievements that made Assam an extra individual, uh, extraordinary individual. He also uh, possessed a warm and engaging personality that we all felt that made him a beloved figure among his colleagues and friends. His smile, his sense of humor, and his ability to lift the spirits of those around him created a very positive and nurturing environment in in any place he, he put a foot in. So um, final words today, as we bid farewell to our dear colleague, uh, let us celebrate the legacy he left behind. His contributions to the field uh, will continue to impact the lives of countless people for years to come. His kindness, compassion, and dedication uh, will always be remembered by all who had the privilege of knowing him. And uh, finally, let us uh, cherish the moment and the memories we shared with Aytham and honor his legacy by continuing to strive for excellence in our own work. May his spirit live in our hearts as, he, as, as we carry forward his, his passion for healing no, no, no. and sorry, his sorry. commitment to making a difference. And thank you very much. And I'll uh, ask Kelvin to run a few of the videos that he has from some of uh, Sam's best friends.
The first time I met Dr. Osman was in London around 2003 while attending the Charing Cross Vascular Surgery meeting. At the time, he was looking for a vascular surgeon from Africa. He told me he has been doing general surgery for three years. He asked me a question. Would the, would the speciality of vascular surgery be beneficial to him? And those he will help in Sudan? I told him that. I, asked, I started my career in 1972 as a general surgeon in the University of Alexandria, Egypt. Since 1983, I have worked only in vascular surgery. I encouraged him to pursue this field. Four years later, during a trip with Rotary Club members to Sudan, I was in the OR operating on a huge aortic aneurysm. I was assisted by two junior surgeons. While I was in a tense state, trying to control the neck of the aneurysm without his assistance. The door, the door opened and the face of Dr. Osman appeared. They told, me that, they told him that there is a vessel uh, surgeon from Egypt in the room. I quickly urged him to, to wash his hands and help me to complete the surgery. Since then, I, I have seen Dr. Osman at least once or twice a year in many parts of the world. I have found Dr. Osman to be a good teacher, kind-hearted, humble, smart, generous, and helpful. He has made a strong impact on young vascular surgeons in Egypt. A few months ago, I, have, I had the honor to be among a group of vascular surgeons guided by him to operate for free in Khartoum. During the recent crisis in Khartoum, Dr. Osman has personally reserved all the rooms throughout the hotel in Aswan and Luxor in South Egypt to house refugees coming from Sudan. The loss of Osman is a major loss of the vascular surgeon community in the Arab world. May his soul rest in peace. Thank you, Dr. Naga. I'm just going to bring up Dr. Alpha Tok's, Professor Alpha Tok's talk, um, video as well. Just bear with me. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, my dear Pascal colleague. I have been asked by Professor Ahmed Dawish to uh, give a very quick uh, talk about our great loss, Professor Osam Osman. Professor Osam Osman is a dear brother to me. Uh, friendship started 1993 in Birmingham University Hostel, where we both worked as a senior instructor in the vascular unit. Um, Professor Assam Osman, uh, his personality is unique. Um, he has a great heart. He's extremely kind. And I remember a huge amount of his stories between uh, uh, us over the last 35 years. Uh, we always are very keen on each other. We always like and respect each other. And we always were competing for perfection in vascular surgery. Um, if there is one event to uh, to mention for Professor Osama Osman, there is a huge amount of event, but the, the one which touched my heart lately, when he has heard about the uh, war in Sudan and his family was in Khartoum, he left from Saudi Arabia to uh, Egypt and he was able to arrange three buses to take not only his relative, but a lot of Sudanese coming as neighbors and friends. He arranged to bring them by buses uh, from Khartoum to the south border of Egypt and was able to bring them into safe land. He done this uh, multiple times with his son coming from New York to help in this regard. And the way if you have seen him while he's getting his family to a safe place, really remarkable man. Uh, we will all will lose him. For me, I've lost a brother and a dear brother. Up till now, I am in a state of shock from his news. Uh, God bless him. I will concentrate on praying for him. I hope we all pray for him and God bless him, and I wish you all the best. Dr. Muhammad Amr al-Faroo, Consultant Vascular Surgeon. 
That was lovely. I think, Kelvin, we've got one more guest here, uh, Professor Rafat Naga, uh, who would like to say a few words about um, about Isa uh, before we before we close. Um, uh, and I'd like to invite Prof uh, Rafat Naga to have a few words. Thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Uh, really, I enjoyed your meeting. And uh, I don't have more than I said about my dear son. He has, he has a, a great heart. He is a very kind man, has a, a very good impact scientifically and practically on the whole generation, new generation in Egypt and Egypt and all, the, all over the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. And um, thank you very much for those uh, for these closing remarks. I think this was all very important for all of us, um, just to give uh, the audience and the faculty a bit of perspective here. Um, Kelvin, myself and Wissam, Kelvin and I are interventional radiologists and Wissam is um, a vascular surgeon. We're based uh, in Norwich, a little known place, uh, a big hospital, but a little known place in the east of England called Norwich. And it was actually Sam who actually introduced us to Martin, and by extension, we met. Uh, we had the pleasure of meeting Zafer, and and uh, well, the result of that was the workshop which we ran in Bahrain uh, as a collaboration between between Norwich and 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 the BDF and Bahrain and and the faculty from 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 the Gulf. And honestly, for for from our perspective, it's been a fantastic experience. We've met. Uh, brilliant people not only I mean the knowledge that was shared and all of that um, was fantastic but but the the friends that we made the friendships that we made but what's interesting is the epicenter of all of that was Isam uh, he was the one who spoke about Norwich a lot um, he is the one who spoke to Ma got us introduced to Martin and and by then they both of them very kindly came and saw us run our course in in the UK so um, it's interesting how certain events bring people together, and um, and 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 this has been this is a legacy of 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 Islam's effort to bring people together, like-minded people together, those who want to promote education and training, and and those who have this uh, enthusiasm for engaging with people and trainees and other uh, and 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 networking with people more widely. So I'm hoping, um, first of all, I want to thank all my faculty. Um, the faculty have been absolutely brilliant. Thank you very much, Martin, uh, from your side. Um, you know, Kelvin and I couldn't have done it without you. Thank you very much, Lafer, for supporting us in this and 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 helping us facilitate these the the, the whole um, events, all the events in general, really, uh, at the BDF. Uh, it's been absolutely a brilliant experience from our perspective, and and we hope. Uh, we hope that this is this is something that we will continue. We look forward to 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 meeting you guys again uh, in Bahrain, and uh, and and we can get everyone back together. This will not only this will be almost like a lasting legacy from uh, from wow. Sam and and the fast fantastic relationships that we have built uh, over this period of time. Um, thank you very much, everyone, and uh, thank you very much. Sorry for the delegates for joining us. I hope you all enjoyed uh, yourselves. And again, thanks again for the faculty for taking time out of your busy schedules to uh, to to share your experiences with us. It was absolutely brilliant actually seeing you guys again after a two-week hiatus. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you. you thank you.